Okay. Man of Matan, we've talked about as being this cinematic horror experience with a huge branching narrative. In shared story mode, your friend can join you in that narrative. And everything you can do in the single player game, you can do with your friend in the shared story game. So it means that when you're exploring this ship in the middle of the Pacific, your friend is there with you, controlling one of the other characters, and you're playing the game together. If they go over to an object of interest, you can join them and look at it together and perhaps talk about that object and try and work out what that object represents and what secrets it contains. When you're having these dramatic conversations between the characters and you're deciding what to do, it's you and your friend talking and deciding together what to do. So it's a very social experience. So why are we making multiplayer in Man of Medan? I think the genesis of the idea came from a prototype that we tried. Wouldn't it be cool to see two players together in the same shared story experience? Both making choices and taking actions that both have a, an impact on the story and the outcomes of that story and where it can go and lead to wildly different outcomes. And to be honest, we've been really surprised that no one else has done this kind of thing in, in a narrative branching story yet. So we gave it a go, tried it out, tested it, saw what worked, what didn't work, and it proved to be a lot of fun. So, uh, good news, bad news. Bad news? How else the others could get any worse? So this is worth progressing with, this is worth trying. We could show two different players together in a scene, walking around, doing interactions together, talking to each other, having conversations with the other non-player characters. Oh yeah, you know how to treat a lady, right? And then they could go into separate areas, so one player could stay on the boat, another player could actually go on a dive and experience very different things. You fancy a pint with your second in command? You? are not my second in command. Third in command. No. And then come back together again and then the characters would talk about it and take that story forward. Hey, what the hell is going on? Uh, hey JJ, don't worry about it. So when you're playing shared story and you have to make a choice, or if the other player has to make a choice, you can't see the choices that they're being presented with. You know they're making a choice, but you don't know what's on their mind. Sometimes you actually get to advise on that choice. You can say what your character thinks is the best thing to do, but they don't have to take that advice. I'm telling you not to drink any alcohol right now. Oh, come on. Telling you? And their choice can have a massive impact. It can affect the whole flow of the game. Sometimes they can be quite subtle and low impact choices, but sometimes they can open up whole new scenes or cause harm to come to another character. So it is a key part of the game and it's a key part of the experience making those choices together. You have me going. Pretty cool. On our previous games, the player character would have had a choice and then the NPCs and non-player characters would have responded to that. But now we have loads of situations where the person you're talking to is a different player. So they actually have a choice about what they can say and where that might go. It's not just about relationships and traits and how that might evolve. It's player agency, whether they say nothing or say the harsh thing or the nice thing or whatever the options might be. So every single conversation has grown massively because of this stuff. And then also, whilst I'm controlling a character, you're controlling someone else. And you might be having conversations with a completely different person in a completely different space. So again, tons of extra data. Julia. But it's worth it Are because okay? we have this really beautiful cinematic experience. You know, I can hear what you're experiencing. If you're talking to someone else in the same room, I can hear that, I can see that, and I can join in with that. I'm just going to say it. Fliss has got to be in on this. One unavoidable technical challenge to overcome is the fact that with any multiplayer game you have latency. But at the same time, in order to maintain the tone and the feel of the game, we want to have as smooth an experience as possible. So we go to some lengths to make sure you don't ever have that problem. I would say the biggest challenge for me has been the sheer quality of data involved and maintaining the quality of that data but still fitting it onto a disc for a console. Designing a branching narrative game already presents a load of challenges and multiplayer, putting a second player into the story exponentially increases those challenges. It really is very difficult. The first thing we do is at the design phase, 
we think of things that will work really well with multiplayer. So these are very, very high level things. Key scenes that really showcase the multiplayer, that really give the players interesting choices and big dilemmas. They're designed on paper and storyboarded very, very early on. And the narrative, to some extent, is structured around them. When we're happy with that, when we've got a narrative that we can really get behind, and this narrative also incorporates the whole of the single player game, then we start to break it down in games terms. We have got a tool we created in-house, which is a massive flow tool for the whole game. And we really break the game down into individual bits in that flow tool. And it has to be very, very exact. Once it's written, then we can actually play the game in a very basic form, just with text and storyboards, but making all the decisions and doing all the exploration. And we play it over and over again. We're trying to test whether the game works well, and we play it multiplayer. So we have two people playing the game in this very basic format, and we're finding out, does the game work? Are there any weak points? Are there any points where one player is not doing enough? And that allows us to iterate and refine the gameplay very, very quickly. And only when we're completely happy with that game in that very basic format do we go into full production and start recording data and putting the rest of the game together. We need to leave. Now. While we do use the Unreal Engine, we've written at the core a game flow tool that allows us to build narrative games and plot out all the different branching possibilities that are required, not just for the choices that a single player can make, but also the differing scenes that multiple players will be in at the same time and how they relate with one another. Then we can build experiences that time correctly because it's no good if one player finishes their section in two minutes and another finishes theirs in 20 minutes. That's just going to be a bad experience for the players. Alex, this is crazy. What we want is for the multiplayer experience to feel as close to watching a movie as the single player experience does. And that's why we've implemented some behind the scenes technology to make sure that this happens. Ah! Ah!